Doctor from the School of Engineering Practice. He's uh, just started this year, uh, January. January. Yeah. Prior to that, uh, he has a PhD in physics from the University of New York in Stonybrook, and then he went on to get an MA in Management and Technology, where he considered the use of uh, corporate innovation and, and taking that over to entrepreneurship. Uh, he worked with Xerox, and then he started Protex, uh, a book scanning company that scans papers. The website says 2,500 pages per minute. We're at 3,000 pages per minute. So I'll also add it to the scan book in eight, eight minutes. Sorry. So pretty, uh, I wrote that to PDF. Um, and so then he's out here at the school, uh, and he was taught, I guess, he didn't talk a little bit about the computer in the school, but then the main topic is introduction to innovation. So there will be type of questions at the end. Uh, please be, it should be interactive. Um, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, like Kevin said, I'm really looking forward to a very lively and interactive session here. But if you guys are just going to sit there like the living dead, you will give you no choice but to lecture. So um, it will be all your fault. So I'm here to tell you about innovation and entrepreneurship. What is innovation? What is entrepreneurship? And maybe challenge some of the ideas you may have, and you're welcome to challenge me back if you'd like. Um, so uh, again, um, these slides are just there as a placeholder for us to start the conversation, and the conversation can go anywhere. Um, no holds barred. So, uh, let me first start with the question. Who could tell me here what's the difference between an invention and an innovation? Yes. Innovation might be uh, a new thought or idea, but an invention is a physical application of a new thought or idea. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. This innovation includes a lot of the invention already in place. Okay, so an innovation is an improvement of an invention. Okay, yep. Invention is something new that you're creating, and innovation is something new but also something that you've already been placed on. So an invention is something completely new and innovation is something incrementally new. Okay, anyone else? Yeah? Anyone else? Who, who agrees with the first statement? The first answer. Who agrees with the second statement? Who agrees with the third statement? About three or four, five. What do you call it overall? <laughs> Tell you what an invention is. An invention is characterized by three things. Who knows what are those three things? What makes an invention an invention? Like everybody would agree, yes, there is an invention. If you make an invention, what would you like to do with that invention? Yes, thank you. Patent. What is the patent examiner when you send it to the U.S. Patent Trade Office, for example, or the Canadian? What, what is the patent examiner going to challenge you on? What, is, what are the requirements that you have to meet? My novelty? Yes, already oh. there. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I don't know that. What's the next one? Keep going. Uh, yes, that's a good one. There's a third one. It requires a reasonably skilled person to come up with this idea. That's not one of the three requirements, but yeah, it gets into the mix. There's a third very important requirement. Specific? Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of words to start, but I think it might be that it like no reasonable combination of something else that already exists could have produced the same result. That's the non obvious. Okay. Right. Yes. Reducible. What's that? Reproducible? Um, it's kind of assumed. Yes. Should be useful? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the three requirements of an invention. If you if it's not obvious, if it's small and if it's useful. <coughs> You can send it to the patent bureau, and you've got yourself a patent. It's 
So that's actually a definition of an invention that nobody can disagree with because it gets you a patent. If it doesn't get you a patent, it's going to be because one of these three things. You actually don't have to create that invention. You don't have to have that prototype working or that product working. It could just be on paper. If you demonstrate that it is novel, it's useful, it's not just, of course, it has to be doable. Uh, then you got yourself a patent. But what you realize that an invention is primarily a technical thing. Right? It's not humanities or social sciences or market research or anything. You don't have to sell it. You never actually have to sell that invention to be able to get a patent and to be called an invention. Now let me ask again, what's the difference between invention and then innovation? Does that kind of give you a clue? Anyone? All right. Let's go to the lecture part. So let me show you the top inventive companies in 2010. Inventive means the ones that published the most patents. IBM, almost five, six thousand patents. Just in 2010 that were connected to IBM. Samsung, 4,500. Microsoft, 3,600. Canon, 2,600, and so on. The top 10 most inventive companies in the world. What strikes you here? There's no apples. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Sell it. 
What if nobody buys that product? Is that innovation? Yes? Who says yes? Who says no? Right. The answer is no. I mean, what if the greatest inventor invents the greatest product on earth that is the uh, most confident that he decides to buy? Is that ever going to make an innovation? And the answer actually is no. Let me tell you now what's an innovation. Innovation actually is completely different from an invention. Completely different. Even though 90% of the people you talk to think it's, well, it's the same thing. In fact, in fact, even senior managers in companies, a lot of them still think invention and innovation is the same thing. I'm here to tell you that they're completely different things. First of all, innovation has to be based on a market need so that you can sell it. There's no market need for your product. Nobody's going to care about you inventing the most exciting of all products. It doesn't matter. They're not going to buy it because it doesn't meet your market need. So it <coughs> innovation first has to address a market need. Now, a market need is not something technical. It has nothing to do with it. It's more of a human or social thing that you, that you identify. And then, and only then, you have to identify a product or a service that's going to fulfill that market need. And then the third part is that you have to figure out how to actually get that product to the customer. And that's what we call a business model. How are you going to get that? Is this going to be a product that you're going to sell? Is it going to be something that you manufacture and sell directly? Or sell through some retail stores? Or sell through some people that knock on the doors? Or sell online? Is this something that you're going to sell at all or just make money like Facebook does through advertising? Right? When you go and use Facebook or Google, you don't pay anything to Facebook or Google. But the way they, they still make a lot of money, how do they do it? Through advertising. That is their business model. They realize there was a need for market for search on the internet. They figured out a product that works better than anyone else. And then they decide they're never going to charge for it, but they're still going to find a way to make money. And their business model is through sponsored ads, Google ads. Also, sure. That's a build-up. That's an extended business. And the fourth point, which is very important, and this is what leads to the confusion between invention and innovation. You have to figure out a way to protect your innovation from other people to come and grab it away from you. And that's what we call a sustainable competitive advantage. So that's why people who make that product will go and file a patent, because the patent will give you 17 years of protection so that somebody else cannot go and do the same thing. If you just open a hot dog stand, that meets a need. People are hungry all the time. That you have a product that they like, you have a business model where you can make money, but you don't have a sustainable competitive advantage. Anyone else can come and actually set up another hot dog stand next to you. That's not an innovation. So you have to meet all the four needs. Now what do you find? What do you see the big difference between invention and innovation? What strikes you here? What is fundamentally different between an invention and innovation? We said invention is a technical advantage. What's an innovation? It's a social event. Right? So that's why engineers, very often when they only think in technical terms, are the worst innovators you can think of. And that's why engineers like you guys need to learn that you need to understand the social dimension of which is really what makes an innovation. Mark Zuckerberger was not like the smartest software engineer. He actually had a minor in psychology and realized the social need of people to socialize. 
anybody could have created the Facebook. Like there was some other Facebooks before that. There was MySpace, there was Plants and so on. But he was able to meet the needs of his market much better than anyone else. And he was able to design the Facebook software to meet those needs better than anyone else. So it was his social insight, not his technical insight. He's, yes, technically is very good, but anyone else, you have mil literally millions of software engineers who could design the same thing as Facebook, given the time and the money he's got to do exactly the same thing, or even better. There are a lot of features <coughs> in Facebook that I don't like. I don't think it's intuitive enough. It's not like the Google, the, the Apple software. But it's really his insight into the social needs and understanding the marketplace that really made Facebook so successful. So that's innovation is primarily the social event. And that is hopefully now you can tell the difference and you realize how big a difference there is. So if you want to be an innovator, then it's an innovation that you have to see against that social initiative. But engineers, once they do that, then they can very often devise a product or design or invent the products that meet those social needs. Social scientists cannot do that as well because they wouldn't know how to go back and develop a technical product or service that meets those social needs. Sometimes the best thing that can happen is a team of technical social uh, social scientists or some, sometimes called anthropologists that understand the human-machine interface that can develop the most innovative products and create the most innovative companies. So the team uh, is very important in terms of really uh, creating a new innovation. So any questions so far? Okay. So let me tell you about something else that an innovation has to have. And it's similar to what we discussed, but in a little more uh, deeper terms, what we call the value proposition. So if you have an idea, and you have made an invention, and you go and you say, okay, I'm going to set up a company, and I'm going to go and talk to investors, or I'm going to talk to some other people to raise money, one of the first questions they're going to ask you is, what is your value proposition? You know, value what? What is a value proposition? The value proposition, in a way, is a, is a way of reformulating what I just said. A value proposition has three parts. The first part is the problem. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? What is the pain, what is, or the want, or the gap in the marketplace that is still causing problems or frictions or that people don't feel good about, or they feel they miss it, or they need it? Sometimes they don't even themselves know they need it, but if you it is there, like the iPhone, for example. Nobody said, oh, we need something like the iPhone that does all of this. But Steve Jobs, with his genius, he understood that the iPhone is going to really meet the needs of the people in ways that the other smartphones would never aspire to do, and he changed it completely. So identify what is that problem. That is the first part of the value proposition. The second part is to figure out the solution a model solution to that problem. And this is where the engineering and the science comes in, is you figure out, you say, okay, I have the skills, or I can put together the skills of all of the friends of mine to develop this unique problem, this unique solution. And if you're chemists or chemical engineers, you know how to do that, and you're able to develop at least a prototype or a proof of concept, what we call, that's going to uh, create that solution in unique ways and novel ways. And then the third part, which a lot of people always miss, okay, once you have that solution, what are the benefits? Okay, you solve the problem, but solving the problem by itself is not enough. It has to have extra benefits. When I get my iPhone, one of the benefits is that everything is intuitive. Anything I look for, I find it right away. And get it to a three-year-old, and they figure out how to pull out the pictures and the movies and the music and all of that. And some of the benefits is that it brings all of my work and my leisure all together. The other benefit is that I don't need a, a hard keyboard. I can go and download applications that are going to do all the new kind of stuff that they could never imagine that all the smartphones could never do. And those are all the benefits. And if you 
figure all of those three parts, you have potential for great innovation for a new company or something that will become very successful. That is your value proposition. So, now let's talk about innovation and entrepreneurship. So that's my next question. What is the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship? Is every innovator an entrepreneur? Yeah. Is every entrepreneur an innovator? No. So what's the difference? So is the iPhone innovation? Yes. Did it come from a startup? It's from an established company, right? Is uh, is a rest is a new rep somebody that starts a new restaurant is that an entrepreneur? Yes. Is he an innovator? Oh she. <laughs> is she an innovator? Why not? Starbucks an innovation. Starbucks has been, has been able to do that. 
based on that, is that an innovation? The answer becomes yes. So now let's talk about innovation and entrepreneurship, and you guys have already touched on that. Innovation can happen in a startup or in an established company. It doesn't have to be in a startup. The iPhone is a great innovation. It happened in a large big company. Although large companies have always much harder time to innovate than smaller companies because they have to protect their furniture. And that becomes huge distraction. It always involves a novel thing. That's what innovation is about. But the novel thinking doesn't mean a novel product. It could be the novel way of the business model. Uh, like Dell, for example. <coughs> Dell did not invent any new computers. But the way it has the build to order model, where you can order a computer online, pay for it, get the latest components at the lowest price, they don't have to go not to a retail store, so they don't have to pay any margins to the retailers. So they make more money, they get paid before you actually ship the product. And they're ahead of everybody else because they have the latest components, and computer components get obsolete in every four months. So that's what helped them become innovation. Their innovation is not in the product itself, it's in their business model. And it has to be defensive. On the other hand, entrepreneurship can only happen in startups. All the people call, talk about intrapreneurs, that is, employees of large companies become entrepreneurial. That's not really what we mean by entrepreneurship. So when you hear entrepreneur is somebody who started a new business. But it doesn't necessarily involve novel thinking. And it doesn't have to be defensive, like a regular restaurant or a coffee shop or a, or a uh, fast food. So, but however, innovation and entrepreneurship become one when it involves a startup that, uh, that brings the business to novel thinking and that business is defensive. Kevin, how much more time do I have? Oh, okay. Very good. So now let's ask, what is an entrepreneur? All right. So what's an entrepreneur? Did I completely confuse you? Yes? Okay, let's find out what's an entrepreneur. So an entrepreneur is an individual, she or he, who sees an opportunity that others haven't seen, and then goes and gets the resources to actually make it happen, to exploit that opportunity. So it starts with not Inventing a new thing in a lab, but as you've seen, IBM has invents every year enough 6,000 patents, um, 12 times more than Apple. But it's somebody who sees an opportunity, so it is a social event as well. It sees an opportunity that people before him or her haven't seen and then decides to go after it. An entrepreneur is somebody also who's guts who's not afraid of taking risks, who's not afraid of walking in a new pathways, and does not feel comfortable not following anybody but me. And that's, and that's uh, uh, an inherent skill to take somebody who likes to do that, or enjoys doing that. And it's also somebody who once they see an opportunity, they introduce a new product or a new service or a process and they create that process on, you know, on service to fulfill or to plug that gap or that opportunity gap that they've seen. And then usually you need money to do that, but that comes last actually, to go and make it happen. You need money to invent and create that product or prototype, you need money to market it, you need money to start a company, you need money to pay other people, because you can't do everything by yourself. So that's what makes an entrepreneur. And if you look at the stats, you find that most entrepreneurs come from college or universities, or have college and university background. Because you need to be able to do that. You need the education, you need the insight, you need the skills 
and those skills live in a very modern, very technologically savvy world, those skills can only be obtained most often through uh, college or university education. Um, so that's the highest percentage. Almost 80% of all entrepreneurs come with university background. And I want to tell you about something that's unique to McMaster. Is that McMaster is one of the unique schools in the world that actually teaches entrepreneurship, not in a way all the business schools do that around the world, even McMaster is really school, but teaches entrepreneurship through experiential learning, where actually the students who come to our center become entrepreneurs, real world entrepreneurs and start a real world company with a real world product during the program itself. And actually get funding during the program itself. So this is a unique model that's actually never been done before. And McMaster is the first one to start it. Now there are other universities that are trying to mimic us. But the Xerox Center for uh, Engineering Entrepreneurship and Innovation is really the first one in the world to start a completely experiential, real world project based program to actually teach people entrepreneurship by doing, by starting a new company. So how do we do that? We have actually created a whole environment that's exclusively designed to start a company around the technological, uh, technology-driven company because that's that those are the ones that you can protect more easily. Technology-based company doesn't mean that it has to be a new product. Technology-based it could be marketed through online products and so on, but it can have to do, it can be anything. And we have ideas from uh, uh, from GPA, uh, GPS locally based social networking to uh, cash management, unique cash management devices to fashion uh, fashion design for the masses, all using the same kind of model. And, uh, and the students are the founders. They start their own company. They, start, they, they have to identify their own ideas at the beginning. And then they carry that idea all the way to hopefully a successful startup and company through those 18 months program. But unlike all the entrepreneurs who are on their own, who are in the cold and have to figure out where to get the money from, where to go set up space, who to talk to, and they don't know anyone, we provide to them the Enterprise Development Lab, which is where they develop the prototype. We provide to them the access to all of the network of faculty and labs and engineers and scientists. We provide to them the mentors outside the business and technical mentors. And for those who qualify, we even give them the funding up to $60,000 if they meet the, the, our, uh, our criteria for viability. And they get all of that without giving up anything from their company. And at the same time, we have essentially only seven courses or seven modules over the full period of 18 months that are actually going to help them, teach them what they need, when they need it, throughout the course of that, uh, that program. So, and um, a lot of them graduate with a master's degree in engineering and entrepreneurship and their own job in their own company if they're successful. So they don't have to go and apply for a lot of job. So this is the, the process. What we call essentially the, uh, the enterprise project uh, uh, process, which has four phases. The phase one is when they start. It starts with uh, the first module, the first course, where they learn about entrepreneurship, value proposition, uh, team building, um, uh, scoping for new ideas, competitive analysis, market research, and then that's when the, what we call the opportunity scanning phase. And then they go through phase gate. Phase gate is a checkpoint where they present to a committee, which is made of the enterprise advisor, a technical mentor, a business mentor, and business development manager. And they present the project and they prove that they've learned everything they were taught and they can make it to the next phase. That is the first thing. Once they pass that, they become eligible to receive funding, seed funding, up to $60,000 to really start now working on their prototype, on their marketing, and so on. 
Then they go into the second phase, which is the technology and market development. And they take two, two more modules that teach them how to do the uh, increase their competitiveness, uh, exclude competitors, make their invention more radical, uh, learn how to the basics of fine proper finance, account, uh, accounting, and uh, uh, how to raise capital, how to negotiate with investors, and uh, the importance of uh, time, uh, 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 time value for money. And, uh, and then they go to a second phase gate, which is to show that now they have a proof of concept, they have market traction, they have identified the real customers, they have sized how big their market is, and then they go to the phase three, which is the business development, and then phase four, which is the actual startup. And we provide to them everything they need along the way, even after they graduate, they can get space in the incubator space at the Mass Innovation Park for essentially free and be able to have access to uh, all of the business community as well. Um, in addition to the faculty, we have a great roster of, uh, of advisors and mentors. Among them is uh, Steve Ellop, the CEO of Nokia, who is actually Hamiltonian. We have Mark Chamberlain, CEO of Drivers. And we have all the faculty and all the business people as well in the, uh, in the community are very successful people in business and education. So um, just going to go quickly through this so we can have some time for questions and answers. And also the seed funding is something that's unique to, uh, uh, to our program. When I started my own company, Kipas Technology, um, uh, one investor asked it for 50% of my company in exchange for $25,000. Of course, I said no. And this is kind of what you get uh, when you have a very risky company, even though your idea may be great. Uh, if you can get investors to talk to you, they're going to ask for a big chunk of your company in exchange for a very small amount of money. And what the Xerox Center does is manage to get money from the federal and provincial government to actually hand up to there is no guarantee uh, that it will, but for the viable projects that we feel are a very strong cause of success, we're willing to fund up to $60,000. And that's the seed funding. That's very often what's needed to go to what's called the value of death, where 90% of entrepreneurs actually will fail because even though they may have a very bright idea, they have no funding because they have no customers. And no investors is going to risk that. Yes? Uh, I know that at McMaster, any intellectual property developed through McMaster Resources or on campus is McMaster's intellectual property. How does that work into the program? It's a very good question. And yes, initially all intellectual property is McMaster's. Uh, but McMaster University is, again, one of the most generous universities when it comes to starting new enterprises. And McMaster will actually relinquish the ownership to that intellectual property and only maintain 1% ownership in the new company to the inventor. Then if it's an inventor, a faculty who's invented the idea, the technology, then an inventor has to negotiate with the entrepreneurs, for example. So if you were to come to our program and you really like an invention that's been done by the chemical engineering department and you know the faculty, and he said, I think I can uh, identify the market opportunity where your invention now can make a lot of money and can become a big successful company. Most of the time, the faculty are not going to be interested in leaving their job and moving to that company. So that's what you negotiate with them. And part of what we teach uh, is those negotiation skills and we bring in the experience in the market so we know what's reasonable. And we have, we have several cases where the inventor, uh, who is a faculty, negotiated some very good deals with the students and they started a company together. And they have that shared ownership. And McMaster maintains only 1% of that company. So that the university take 1% of the I'm just curious how the third This is, yeah, this is, um, I was talking about the seed funding, that's the $60,000. The university, the program of the Xerox Center of the University takes no additional equity in exchange of that $60,000. Okay. The uh, university maintains 1% for the intellectual property the inventions. But if you're a student and you invent something during the program, like uh, 
new uh, uh, application or something, that's all yours. University shares nothing. Not even like one percent. Any more questions? So, I uh, just wanted to show you the Enterprise Development Lab, which is essentially a space that's been uniquely designed to foster brainstorming, exchange of ideas, team formation, and new ventures. And this is where essentially the students have their own uh, space where they can develop their ideas and interact with all the students and form the teams. Uh, we also have an incubation center on Longwood Avenue with uh, uh, Master Innovation Park is, again, it's only dedicated to our students who may still be in the formation stage or have graduated from our program. And this is how we've been doing so far, and uh, the numbers are getting better. Uh, the number of students so far are about 80 students that joined our program. Uh, our classes are fairly small, they tend to go between 20 and 30 students from per class because there's a lot of attention that needs to happen. And the number of projects so far are 39. The number of teams that were formed, uh, 39. The startups that have been created from the program, about 15 companies, uh, created 45 jobs, uh, filed about nine patents, and four of them uh, have been negotiated, lic licenses negotiated. And these are some of the students that, uh, uh, that have actually graduate from our program uh, that talk about the, uh, the importance of the program to them. Um, Frank Ashton is uh, a Kaufman fellow with a PhD in Cambridge University <coughs> and the leader of one of the new companies also that received funding. Uh, we have Andrew Ford received the uh, Haley Jerome Award for 2012 in Canada. And uh, he uh, says this has equipped me with an ability to conceptualize big ideas. Um, he um, says it's a dream come true, and I've also been given the opportunity to accelerate my success through real funding support. And uh, he's the founder, uh, co founder of a company called Ogo, which is a, a, a proximity based social network. Um, Mahmoud Hashem uh, started a new company to compete with the uh, uh, with the grading scanners, where you have to uh, fill out multiple choice and they grade it. And he has a software now that can essentially eliminate the, completely the cost of that scan and the paper. Um, Prem Kumar, it's a one-stop shop that offers all the tools and resources required to become a successful entrepreneur. Also, received forty thousand dollars. So I will close by saying if you have any questions or are interested, uh, you have my contact information. Uh, feel free to come and see us or ask more questions. Or if you have any other friends that are interested in this unique program, let them know. Uh, doors are always open. Uh, at this point, let me uh, open the floor for uh, more Q&A. Any questions? Is this exclusive to students, or can, can anyone come to it from this? The, uh, the what? The, the funding in the lab and so on? Yeah. Yeah, the, the funding in the lab is exclusive to the students that go through our program. However, the money that we have for funding is also available for other students outside our program that may have already started their own company, and they still have to come through and uh, present to us and, uh, and meet the, uh, the eligibility requirements. Now, the eligibility requirements are not specific to our program, they are very general. That means you have to have uh, somewhat of a strong value proposition, you have to have a proof of concept, you have to have size in the market, you have to know what you want to do with the money, and you have to show that you have a team, and all the other requirements, and if you do that, then you are eligible. That it has to be a McMaster student that is still working in a master's program or graduated from the program and is seeking that funding to start a new company. Uh, how do you evaluate the risk and setting companies that are going to present to you with the investors? That's an excellent question. Nobody really knows how to do that. <laughs> So um, startups are inherently risky. 
because you don't have all the information you need. Even if you knew what is it that you need to find out, like for example, the number of customers that are going to buy your product, you can't really pin it down completely. You can go and figure out how big is your market, you can go and talk to your customers, you can do surveys, and you can use that feedback to guide your product. And that's what we teach our students to do. If you never know for sure how many will actually buy your product when you actually make it. The other thing is that you can never be sure whether, uh, and that depends on the complexity of your product, whether you, how long it's going to take you to develop your product. Even large companies like IBM and Xerox and so on, they always miss the mark when it comes to the time and cost that it's going to take to develop a new product, a completely new product. And so the risk is always there, but it's um, it, it, it's something that's new and that can change the current world as we know it. And that's what motivates a lot of entrepreneurs. If the risk wasn't there, then everybody would become an entrepreneur and innovate. But it's that risk really that makes the it's the risk of the unknown, right? You know where you're going, you know the direction, but you don't always know what the hurdles are going to be, you don't know how long it's going to take. And so you, we help our students minimize that risk by asking the right questions at the right time. And that dramatically improves the cost of success. But there is a lot of risk that will remain hidden that nobody can cover. That's part of the Questions? Anyone who's more interested in innovation now than you were an hour ago? Uh, so I've got uh, Dr. Luffy's contact details. If any of you have any questions for him, um, you can I can pass it on to you. Otherwise, uh, just a take token of our thanks very much yep. for your time.